We're in Romans today. What a surprise. And uh, we're back to, um, it's, a, it's a great section. By the way, I'm going to mourn a little bit because when we get to June, we're going to stop looking at Romans for a while and we'll pick it up in, in the new year next year in 2016, God willing. It's a long time. I, I'm with you, Lord. I mean, you know, I could, I could do this for a long time. But uh, there's a real natural cut in, in Romans, just like right smack dab through the middle. And it ends right at the end of chapter 8. And he really changes subject drastically into 9 in the end. So uh, end of 8 is a good place to finish it this summer. We'll take a breather. We'll go on vacation in our minds for a while because our heads get kind of full. And we'll digest a big meal. And then we'll come back in January next year and finish up Romans. And, uh, and we'll see what's there. What's there is really incredibly fascinating. So, uh, and, and, and by the way, you know, if you miss Romans enough, you can just read it. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, <wait. laughs> Thank you. Yes. Okay, I got an announcement. This is really important. I forget announcements at this phase, so Wayne's reminding me. Doris Hansen is going to be up here next Saturday at a men's breakfast over at Aldersgate at 8 a.m., uh, but it's more than a men's breakfast. Anyone can come. Uh, anyone's invited. And Doris is going to come up and talk about the ministry to polygamists and all that kind of stuff. So uh, she'll be here at Aldersgate, across town, uh, just, you know, just below 700 South. And, um, and come. Anyone's invited. 8 a.m. Is there a cost, Wayne? No cost? Donations. Donations. Yeah, and there'll be food there and all that kind of stuff? Yeah. Food. I'm in. So, <laughs> so anyway, yeah. So 8 o'clock. Next Saturday. If you wait till next Sunday to remind you, be reminded, you'll miss it. So, <laughs> so this is your last notice, final notice, the end. This is where you get the pink letter in the in the mail. Final notice, doors will be your Saturday. So, well, well, yeah. Let me do a quick Channel Twenty update. Um, it turns out it, we, there's there's a little bit more motion toward the station being sold. Uh, uh, well, it's kind of a long story, but anyway, it's it's been in a slow motion process of being sold. They they accepted an offer. It's got to be approved by the FCC, and now the FCC has got their approval. Uh, uh, they haven't approved it yet, but they've gone into a period of public notice, and so the TV station will actually run some spots during its broadcast week. And that was that last week or this next week, Scott? I can't remember, but it's this week. Yeah, and they'll be posting spots that saying that the station is changing hands is how the FCC or any public government uh, authority who's trying to deal with uh, shepherding a public resource like the airwaves notify people in case you don't like it you can say something so <coughs> should we say something to the FCC that we don't like it you could uh, and I don't know how influential it'll be um, and you got to use more you got to use more arguments than we just don't like it so, but that's going to be going on this week. That means that they really are serious toward getting to the end of approving the sale uh, by the FCC. They're also going to run ads in, uh, uh, I think, the Tribune downtown. Um, so they have to run ads for public comment as well. Yeah, Oscar. They're Telemundo? Yeah. Really? Well, I know it's going to be a Spanish-speaking station after us. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll see. <coughs> yeah, that's a problem. What, what did you say? No, and that's the deal. The new owners don't want to have a religious programming on the air. Uh, so they're not going to continue on Doris's programs or Earl's. Earl's on twice a week on Tuesdays and Fridays, and Doris is on, Doris on twice a week? Thursdays and another day, I can't remember. Is it Tuesdays? So anyway, that's, that's going to stop being broadcast from TV20. So we are actually in a... Uh, a plan we made a couple months ago, we're executing putting together a replacement TV studio at Mill Creek Church down Salt Lake, and we will continue uh, recording and producing shows for Doris and for Earl. They're just going to be broadcast on the internet and broadcast in a, a different way, kind of a cutting edge, right, Scott? Cutting edge. A cutting edge way. So we're turning the entire thing on both shows into internet broadcasts. And uh, if you want to be uh, on the list to be notified when new episodes go up, uh, that'll be automatic, so you really, you'll never miss any of the episodes. But we will continue to produce Doris's shows down in uh, Salt Lake and produce Earl's shows down in Salt Lake. We're just going to broadcast them on the Internet. So, uh, and they'll all be recorded and posted, yeah. yeah. So there's still great response to both shows. An interpreter? No. No. From Spanish to English, you mean? No, what people will be speaking in Spanish, other will translate into English. 
I doubt it. <laughs> Telemundo is a yeah, that's a big network. It's a big Spanish speaking network. So so Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you'll see a whole different switch over in programming. It won't be any of the old stuff. So, well, that's what we're working on right now. So we'll, we'll be giving out information for people. Yeah, so we're not quite there yet, but we're working on that. We're trying to figure out ways to make that the easiest for people who aren't used to doing this. So, yeah, Wayne. Yeah, I know. I know. And that's kind of sad. But there are internet flippers. <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of hard. It's kind of hard to say. And the dirty little secret is that uh, broadcast TV is in a world of hurt right now because people are moving their viewing habits over to the internet. So they're not watching as much broadcast TV. <laughs> so that's that. Did, did you have a question? Yeah. Yeah, in fact, Scott's working on uh, Roku right now and the Roku boxes. We tried doing it with Chromecast, and these are all devices that you attach to your TV and you interact with your TV and you watch it like a TV channel on your TV. But you have to have an internet connection behind it. So th they've got pros and cons, and they're not always, they're not at always very reliable. So we're, just, we're trying to work through all those things and see. You were going to say something, Scott? No? Okay. <laughs> Pray for Scott. He's up to here and all this stuff right now and just he's getting ready to die from technical overload. So uh, it's crazy stuff. And we're in the process, like I said, building that studio down at down Salt Lake City. So we're doing that right now as well. A bunch of junk in my office for that. So Whew. Well, that's a good update. It'll be good. It'll be good. It really yeah, it'll be good. Okay, let's get back to Romans. Romans. Simply Romans. Okay, we got to a point in Romans in chapter 5, where he starts out chapter 5 and says a remarkable thing right here. It's really the turning point in everything he's set up to that point in Romans. And he says, in the past tense, therefore, since we have been justified, that is made right with God, our relationship with God is cool now, by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that peace means a coming together. So he says that in the beginning of chapter 5 and turns an incredible corner and says, now... You're right with God, period. And I would think you could quit the book right there because wasn't that the big issue? Well, actually, there's more issues that go on after that because when you talk about what Christ has done for us, there's what he's done in justifying us, making us right with God instantly, instantly. And now it's past tense. It's done. There's, there's nothing that you can do for the rest of your life to reverse what Christ has done for you. It, it's done. You don't have to live an exemplary life. You don't have to toe the line on any good lists. I mean, that does not affect that justification, being made right with God. Past tense, done. But there is a second part of the story of what Christ has done for you, and that's this thing we call sanctification. It's the slower process of remaking you from the inside out. Has no bearing on your justification, being made right with God. That's done. But God has us in this game here, in this sinful place, for the purposes of slowly remaking us, slowly remaking us from the inside out, changing our hearts, changing our actions. And that's where Paul has switched to after this verse in chapter 5. And that's where we are today. What is this life like now? Now that we are in relationship with God, we're justified, we're made right with Him. Is that the end? Well, no. Now we're doing stuff now that's beneficial for us, but has no effect on our salvation. But it still is really beneficial for us. Super beneficial. So that's where we are today. He's going to deal with this horrible thing about daily temptations. We still have these daily temptations to rebel and these sins creep all around us. And that's kind of the center of what his discussion is right now. Okay, so you're made right with God, period, the end, past tense. But now that we're still here, doggone these sins. They just get in our way. So how do we deal with these things? How do we deal with these things? Is there any sense in which if you fail to deal with a sin that you do tomorrow, that it will endanger being made right with God? No, not at all. Past tense, made right with God. But there is an issue that sin has in our lives that God's trying to change us in the midst of it. So that's the topic today that's beneficial to us. Last week we looked at this. He's talked about the fact that something fundamentally has changed in our relationship between sin and us after coming to Christ. And the first thing he says out of three is that 
this, this hold, this domination that it has on us, like puppet strings, have been cut because the puppet's dead. <laughs> That's us. In a sense, we have died with Christ, and so the ability for sin to dominate us, to make us do what it wants to do almost against our own will, those strings have been cut, and they've been cut not by eradicating sin, but by the old us dying. So you can't, you can't animate a dead body, and that's what he gets at. Something fundamentally has changed such that we went before Christ to a life where we were dominated and enslaved to sin, and now it's disconnected from us. doesn't mean sin's not around anymore, but it means it doesn't dominate us anymore. Now we're in this new realm post-Christ where we actually have a choice to sin rather than being in a slavery and in a bondage to sin. You had no choice before that. Now, a lot of people, we talked about this before, would say, well, I always had a choice to sin or not. I always had a choice to do good or not. So I don't know what you're talking about, about being enslaved to sin. Okay, <laughs> we get that. But the issue, sin is a bigger issue than just what, you're, what you do on the outside of your life, what your hands do and what your words speak. It's really much more about the motivation of the heart that leads to that. So really, the bigger question is, so what if I didn't kill somebody? I mean, I didn't get out a knife and kill somebody, but what if my heart really wanted it very badly? Then it's just, you might as well have done it. And Jesus tells us this. So really, this, this bondage is not so much a bondage just of what we do on the outside. It's a bondage of what our heart desires. And our heart is born so terminally selfish that it exploits people for what we want. And that works its way out into our outer members and there's evil out there. So there really is a bondage in the sense that your heart can't stop from doing that. It's, it's, that's just the way it is. But now, after Christ, that bondage relationship with sin is cut. It no longer has to dominate you. Now you can choose to be in it or out of it. And that's what's brought him to the second point, which is, but why would you choose it? He says right here, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, that's the uh, rest in peace there, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. You see, it's the domination of sin that's changed. For one who has died has been set free from sin. So that's a radical shift after coming to Christ. Our relationship with sin is now it no longer dominates us. And then he talked about this. Now that it doesn't dominate you, why would you voluntarily go into its employ? And that was his point last week. Now you can choose. So why would you choose to go back into sin, to a life of sin? And he likened it to this whole thing about uh, going in for work someday. And what you do is you go to work and you go to work for master sin. And you put yourself at its disposal and you say, I'm here to report to you to do whatever you want. And I'm here voluntarily. And I'm here because at the end of the day, I expect a payday. I expect a wage. And many times, not many times, all the time when we elect to go into sin, regardless of what it is, we go into it believing a lie that comes from somewhere that tells us that participating in this life of sin will be good for you. But it's not. It's a lie. The payday at the end of voluntarily participating in sin is death. Now. Like, right? It doesn't bring you any, it doesn't, as opposed to life, it doesn't bring you life. It brings you a vacuum of life. It's death. And he says it very clearly at the end of, of the chapter we looked last week. The wages, the payday of sin is death. So now that you're not in bondage and you have to do it, why would you elect to go into its employ today knowing that the payday is not life? It's death. So he's made his first two points here about your relationship to sin has changed, doesn't dominate you. You can choose it, but why would you when its end is yucky? It, it reminds me of a real famous uh, stage routine that Bill Cosby does. Bill Cosby himself, he did this years ago, like maybe 20, 30 years ago. And he does this thing about, about talking about this guy in the office who talks all week about, man, when I get to the end of the work week, you know, I'm going to go out Friday night and I'm going to put down so much beer and whiskey, I'm just going to get totally wasted and that's just going to be great, you know. And so he goes out and he's promising himself this all week, promising himself he's going to get wasted at the end of the week, gets to Friday, woo Miller time, he goes out, gets totally wasted, finds himself in the bathroom. Here's Bill Cosby on the stage doing this kneeling, you know, in front of a toilet. Remember the scene? And he's just, he's just heaving his life out in this toilet because he's drunk so much that night. And then I remember really clearly, Bill Cosby looks up from that and looks at the, looks at the audience and says, now remember, you've been promising yourself this all week. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, what was I thinking? If this is the end, 
what? Is there life in this? There's not. So there's something about sin that entices us on the front and it looks like it makes sense. But in the end, there's no life in it. So why would you voluntarily go to work for sin again when you know at the end there's no life in it? So that's his first two arguments. Today he's going to go to a third argument. Not only is your relationship to sin, it's not dominating. It has a bad payday. Why would you do that? But now here's the new one today. We haven't gotten to today yet. And it looks more like this picture right here. Dun, 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 dun. It's marriage. It's a marriage relationship. So this is this third kind of argument about our new relationship to sin. And so this is where we start off today. Romans 7, chapter 7, verse 1. He said, now, or, or do you not know, brothers, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, that's a Jew, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. So he's going to go back to this argument that in some sense, the old me died after I came to Christ. And now he's not talking about the domination of sin. He's talking about a relationship to the law. Ah, and what is the law? The law is a statement of what godliness looks like. It's a statement, you know, if here's God and here's the people of God, this is what the people of God will look like because they're related. It's really a statement of God's nature embodied in man, what it would look like. And the perfect, perfect reflection of that is Jesus himself. So here's the law. The law does two things to us. The law not only condemns us because we don't do it, but it also attracts us because the core of the law is absolutely beautiful. And I'm talking about things like justice and mercy and faithfulness, things in the law that are just very valuable and they're a reflection of who God is. So now he's saying, after we've come to Christ and been justified to God through Christ, not only does sin no longer dominate us, not only does it not make sense to participate in the payday of sin, but in a sense, the law has been disconnected from us because a law doesn't work if you die. And he's going to use the marriage relationship. This is how he's going to illustrate it. He's going to say, a married woman is bound by law to her husband while she lives, but if her husband dies, she's released from the law of marriage. So there's an example, he says, of a law that works as long as you're alive, but once you're dead, the law is no. Oh, great example. So something has changed in our relationship to the law, the statement of righteousness, the standard for the people of God. Something has changed, and once we die, the old us dies by being crucified with Christ. Now the law itself can't touch us. Hey, just like a wife is free. And he, and he expands this a little bit. He says, well, let me tell you, verse 3. Accordingly, she'll be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is still alive. So if he doesn't die and she wants to go for another man, she would be called an adulteress. I know this raises lots of polygamy issues in our heads. <laughs> but this is, this is the law. While this man's still alive, the law of marriage still exists. She can't marry another man. She'd be called an adulteress while he's still alive. But, if her husband dies, she's free from the law. Ah. And if she marries another man, she's not an adulteress. So here's a very concrete example of a law that when there's a death, the law is null and void. And in that same way, we've died with Christ. We've been crucified with Christ. And the, and the effect that the law had on us for condemning us, for not being the people of God, for not having all those attributes, suddenly that condemnation of the law is gone just in the same way that the law of marriage is gone from a, from a wife who's widowed and she marries again. She's not adulterous, she's just married to another man. The law is still there, but the death changes the law's effect on us. And this is where Paul's coming to. It's a really fascinating idea. So I'm going to do silly pictures. Can you tolerate some silly pictures this morning? <laughs> silly pictures. So let's talk about the relationship between us and the law. And the law is good, we'll talk about this in a second, but the law does condemn us because it is so good we're not. And that's the requirement of the people of God. So here it is. Here's the law. There's my stylized Ten Commandment. And when we're under that law, the law constantly says beautiful and wonderful things about the way people and societies and cultures that are part of God should reflect God. I mean, it's, it's gorgeous in many respects. And yet, when, it's, when we see that and we love it, we also say to ourselves, uh-oh, I don't do it. I try, but I don't do it. I never, I never succeed in doing it. And even when I succeed in keeping the outer extremities of my life from doing the nasty stuff, <laughs> I'm 
my heart is still wishing for it. What's my problem? So it's still, you know, it's part of who we are. The law continually amplifies how far short we are of the glory of God. So it does. And that's why God gave it. We've already talked about this in the previous chapters of Romans. God gave it to kind of turn up the contrast. Remember when you had a TV that had a contrast knob? When was the last time you saw a TV with a contrast knob? <laughs> I just realized I must be getting old. Yeah, but you could turn up the contrast knob and the dark gets darker and the light gets lighter and it, it distinguishes things. It's very much what the law did. The law came in to turn up the contrast and say, oh, you think you're bad? You think you don't measure up? Well, let me just show you how you don't measure up. Ooh, law, woof, I'm bad. And, I, and my heart desires bad. So there we are under the law. And he's going he's gonna to switch his metaphor just a little bit here, but hang on with him. It's our relationship with the law. Verse 4, so likewise, my brothers, likewise, this is where he moves away from the husband-wife metaphor, likewise, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ. So your relationship to the condemnation of the law has changed. The law can't touch you anymore. Yeah, but wait, wait a second. I'm still kind of sinful. I know. But the law no longer condemns you. Why? Because you've been justified already. You've been made right with God already through Christ, through what he did to satisfy the law. So the law no longer hovers over you like this and bows you down and says, you know, woe is me. I'm a puke. I can't get anything done. It, it, that relationship has changed. Just like the law in a marriage that enforces you know, husbands and wives, when one of them dies, the law no longer affects you. Well, guess what? You die with Christ and the law no longer touches you. What? Yeah. You mean in the Ten Commandments it says, thou shalt not steal, and now I can go out and steal? Because it can't touch me? No, we've already been talking about this. Go back about you know, a couple paragraphs. He's saying, no, that's not the case. But, but here's the deal. It's not because the law was wrong when it said do not steal. Steal. I mean, not stealing is a great thing. You know, you look, you look at what's going on in some of the protests in Baltimore right now and how they're just stealing from stores and the craziness going on. Now, stealing is not right. But it doesn't condemn you anymore when your heart wants to steal. So I get a get-out-of-jail-free card? Well, no. And it's, it's more complicated than that, which is why he's been doing these examples. The law is good, and what the law stipulates is good, and it reflects the goodness of God. But that law no longer will condemn you when it comes to judgment. Because Jesus fulfilled it. That's what's different. Your relationship with the law is switched. So we're dead. The law can no longer have domination on us because we died with Christ. That old us died with Christ. The law doesn't do that to us anymore. So that you may belong to another. So now he's actually extending his marriage. Not only, and if I go back to this, not only have we died through the law in the body of Christ, but we've done so so that we can belong to another. So it's not about coming out from under the domination of the law so we can just do whatever we want to do. It's actually coming out from under the domination of the law so we can give ourselves to another, like the widow. Well, who's the other? He tells us right here. Here's my cheesy graphics. To him who's been raised from the dead. So really, the law that we used to be under that bowed us down and condemned us for always falling short on our own efforts now we're out from under that law and we're free, like a widow would be, we're free from that law to now be joined to another. And that other is Christ himself. So the whole point in this entire debate that he's talking about is that we're, we're free from the power of sin. Need some, need some water, Linda? You okay? PJ, I'll get you something. So we're free from that and now we're free to establish a relationship with Christ. And that's the benefit. It's not just being out from under the condemnation. It's actually living for him. And that's a radical difference. When I talk to people about being saved, I'll say, what is it you're saved from and what is it you're saved to? When they say saved from, well, I'm saved from hell, I guess, and, and the wrath of God and judgment, and I guess I'm saved from all those things. Yeah, great, that's good. So what are you saved to? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> you're saved to life with him. The one prevented the other. So it's really, it's really going from one to the other. For instance, you know, I, I, I love war movies. I watch war movies when Dorothy's out of town. <laughs> this was a war movie weekend for me. But uh, there's, a, there's a Rambo one. I forget which one it is where he goes. Does he go to Vietnam and he frees these guys in jail there? Was that the original Rambo? I can't remember. Anyway, uh, 
have to go rewatch it this afternoon. But, but, but he goes and he frees them from this jail in Vietnam or something like that. And he springs the guys out and, and they say, hey, we're free, we're free. We're out from under this domination and this enslaved. Oh, we're free. And what if, what if Sylvester Stallone got a helicopter and got on it all by himself and said, good luck with that, bye. And he still leaves them in Vietnam. They were saved from that, but what were they saved to? Uh, bad. They need to be saved to a new life. You replace the one with the other. And that's what he's saying here. We're replaced from being under the law that condemns us and we're being able to be saved to life with God. That's where real life is. That's where real life is. So that's what he's just saying. It's sort of like that whole idea. He goes on, in order that we may bear fruit for God. There's been a lot of debate about this phrase for years. Because <laughs> people say, well, wait, if this is the extension of the husband-wife metaphor, then does that fruit mean like children? <laughs> that's not a very popular interpretation. But, you know, in the context, you get to go, well, uh, yeah, it's not that at all. If you look a little broader, you realize that's not what he's getting at. But what he's getting at is that, uh, by contrast, what was the fruit when you were under the condemnation of the law? Well, the fruit was guilt, condemnation, shame. I mean, all the things that go along with not measuring up to God's standard. That's not fruit for God. It's not. But in relationship with God himself through Christ, that relationship starts to change you. You know, it changes your relationship to sin, changes your relationship to the law, changes who you are just being in that close proximity to God. It changes the very nature of who you are deep down inside. And then suddenly, things from the inside of you start to spring out to the outside and you start bearing fruit that reflects who God is. And it only comes through relationship with Him, not by trying to imitate who He is through the law. These are two different things, radically different. The one brings condemnation and death, he says. The law illustrates sin and the sin brings death that's not really great fruit but god has to get on the page to tell us that we really don't measure up and that's why the law is there but if you want real fruit in your life fruit that's tasty and wonderful and bright and clean and sweet and reflects who god is you do it through relationship with him not by trying to mimic his law two different approaches and that's what he's getting at that'll finally bear fruit for me no, for God. <laughs> so God's in the process of keeping us here for a while for the purposes of glorifying him by producing fruit in our life that reflects who he is. Now I can give you dozens of examples of how this works, but, but I always go back to my little mini orchard I had in Spokane. I had lots of fruit trees. I had lots of fruit trees. And the fruit tree in the wintertime was a total mystery which kind of apple it was. In the wintertime, you can't tell. Every fruit tree... Well, every apple tree looks like every apple tree. And I had four or five different varieties of apples. So what you'd have to say to yourself was, well, when the spring comes, we'll know. Well, the spring comes and the leaves come out. Well, the leaves all look the same pretty much too. Darn, this is just not helping. But when the apples come out, the fruit tells you the nature of the tree. Well, that's exactly what he's talking about here. That's why he uses the metaphor of fruit. There's things that will appear on the outside of your life that reflect a changed nature on the inside. And that changed nature actually is being made more and more like God all the time through his work and not my own. Through his work and not my own. And it's genuine fruit. It's genuine fruit. It's stuff that it comes from the inside out. There is a false religion that tries to put the fruit on the outside without changing the inside. And I could go hang grapefruits on my apple trees, but it wouldn't make them grapefruit trees. It's false fruit. So like, that's, that's the reverse way of doing it. Find out, you know, look in the law, find out what the fruit's supposed to look like, and then tomorrow morning get up and try and make some fruit on the outside of your life. But your heart's not in concert with that. It doesn't work. But there's something about us in relationship with God. Now that we've come to Christ, now that we've been justified by Christ, we've been made right with Him, there's something that God says, Ha! Now I'm going to remake you from the inside out, and gradually on the outside of your life, there will be fruit there that people will say, hey, that looks pretty tasty. What happened to you? <laughs> and they want to know what happened on the inside. And the answer is Christ. The answer is Christ. He's remaking us. That's this whole, this whole big religious word called sanctification. He's actually remaking us. He doesn't have to because once we're justified and made right with God, he could have quit right there, taken us to heaven, enjoyed him forever. But he wants to remake us so that from the inside out, genuine fruit comes out. That glorifies not me, it glorifies God. Glorifies God. That's what it's all about. 
For while we were living in the flesh, here's my poor guy, isn't he sad? While we were living in the flesh, and when he says in the flesh, he means under your own efforts, under your own, when I think flesh, I, th- I think of this. Check out these guns, okay? <laughs> hey, you're laughing at my guns. Okay, that's the flesh. And for me, it's very weak, and probably for you too, right? That's, so whenever Paul says the flesh, think what you can do in your own power. That's, what, that's all he's saying, what you do in your own power. So while we were living in our own power, trying to do the law in our own power, our sinful passions, ah, which is what our heart's all about, aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. So he's saying in a very clear terms that if you rely on your own efforts to try and mimic the law and do good, the result is not going to be pretty because you still have sinful passions. Your heart still wants something else. It wants to be served. It wants to be the center of the universe. It wants to be me, 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 mine, mine, mine. I want everything, and I want everything and everyone to serve me. And by the way, that's the way we're born. Look at a newborn, and you'll see that's exactly what they are. <laughs> Where it's all about us. We're born that it's all about us. It's the way it is. And we exploit people, and we learn as we grow up how to exploit people, so it's all about us. The amazing thing about the change after Christ is it starts to not be all about us. It starts to be all about him. It changes. That's part of the radical insight change. But he's saying this is what it is. You try and do this on your own, you still got the sinful passions. How are you doing on dealing with your sinful passions? Not very good. It's very hard. It's really hard. And I come across contexts of life every day that I try in my flesh to restrain my reaction and fortunately, I don't kill anybody, but my heart wants to. My heart wants to. And I, I, I was going to bring up driving again, but I'm not going to. But that's the best example I have. It, it, that's what really, it gets to me better than anything else. I'm driving and someone does something stupid, and I think to myself, why did you get in my way today? Because this is my road right now. Get out of my way. This is my way. Me, 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 mine, 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 mine. So there are passions of the heart that still flare up because we're born that way. Part of who we are. And if you try and deal with those in the flesh, you can change your reactions on the outside. That is, I did not pull a gun out of the glove compartment and shoot the guy. I consider that a success. (laughs) But I still really fantasized about it. (laughs) My fantasy, actually, is not a gun in the glove compartment. It's, It's rockets built into the car. And they have these switches on the dashboard with those little protective covers on them. And I flick up the protective cover and I go, rocket number one. And then the dust of them goes past my car and, and I still have my way. Come on, you think like this too. Um, but but that, that's, uh, that's our hearts. Our hearts think that the world exists to serve us. And this is not the way it is. This is God's turf. And, we, and his creation exists to serve him. And the funny thing is, is that when we actually make that turn, when we follow Christ, to serve him rather than ourselves, in a, in a strange paradox, we find ourselves most happy in life when we're the least concerned about us. It's a strange paradox. A strange paradox. It's, it's not even that much of a paradox because you understand that when a, when a man and a woman get married, you know, you know that honeymoon period at the beginning? And, and you could be in the midst of the worst circumstance you could possibly think of. Uh, Dorothy's parents... Uh, dated while World War II was hot and heavy and really going. And he was off in, uh, in the Pacific uh, Theater. And, uh, you know, the circumstances can be really hard and the future is very uncertain. But there's something about this love that says that stuff will all take care of itself as long as I got you. And that's very much what our relationship with God switches to all of a sudden. We don't, we're not really that, that terrified about how the circumstances will impact us as long as we have him. Because he's in charge. He'll take care of things. He'll make things right. It, he'll, it, suddenly we are under the umbrella of his love and we don't have to be laying in our beds at night trying to go to sleep, dwelling on the things that could potentially go wrong from what happened during today. He loves us. He's got more power than the entire universe. He speaks and planets and stars come into existence and he loves us. I guess I can go to sleep. That love, is there something about that love that turns us away from the me, 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 my, 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 and it turns us into you, 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 you. And that's a great delight 
And it's a great peace. And it's a great rest. And that's why we pray like we did earlier this morning. God, we understand that you love us tremendously, so much so demonstrated through the death of Christ. We understand you love us so much tremendously that if I come to you right now, you will be very interested in hear what my needs are, even though you already know them. And you lean down and you put your ear next to us and we say, well, God, I'm, I'm hungry. Can you deal with that? And you say, yes, I can. Because if we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all these things will be taken care of. So there really is this transformation of our heart away from me when it's eclipsed by the love of him. And that's what he's trying to work out in and through you so that eventually fruit shows up on the outside that reflects him. The only reason that I forgive people is because I understand how much God's forgiven me. Now, now Jesus is very clear. He says, if, if you're not forgiving people, <laughs> then God's forgiveness for you doesn't count. Well, it, it does, but what he's saying is that if you have been forgiven so much, it ought to radically transform how you love forgiveness. And it starts to incorporate into who you are. And things start to change. You start to look like the thing you love. And what is the thing you love? God himself. I start forgiving more readily than I ever did before, even in the face of egregious offense. And I've had some pretty bad offenses. And it's not because I'm a stellar forgiver. It's because I've just come to love the dimension of God's forgiveness. I love it so much. I want it to be part of who I am. And I ask, God, God incorporate it into who I am. And then the next time an egregious offense happens, and I'm and I genuinely and authentically forgive, and it's visible as fruit on the outside of me, people say, that's not natural. <laughs> what do you mean you can forgive me? I just did the most horrible thing you can think of. How can you do that? Well, let me tell you about the God that forgave me. And let me tell you about how he's been reworking my heart because I love his forgiveness, and I love forgiveness shown in my life. It's no longer a matter of the law saying you ought to forgive. It's a transformed heart saying, I love to forgive because he's remade me. It's a, it's a radical difference. It's a radical difference. But now we are released from the law having died to that which held us captive. <sighs> so if you're currently living a life right now where you have the law enumerated on a to-do list on your bedside table and you have to do it every day and click off the things on the law you're supposed to do, stop it. Because we're freed from the law. The law will no longer condemn you at judgment. You don't have to. Well, but does that mean that I shouldn't be nice to people? Is that what you're telling me to do? You mean I can go outside and do anything I want to? No, you don't get it. The issue is, is that God glorifies himself as good comes out of our life when he works from the inside out, not when you work from the outside in with a to-do list. It's different. The law is still wonderfully good, but the approach about how he glorifies himself as he, dis as he displays it in your life is a different. It's an inside-out rather than outside-in process. It's not lists. It's relationships. I mean, uh, the relationship transformation we all know about. I mean, Dorothy and I got married uh, 38 years ago, I think. Let me see, let me see, let me see. 76 to 2015. How far is that? Let's say there's somewhere in there. And 39 years? Anyway, and in that time, she has changed me. And I've changed her. There, you know, much of what my love for music is came from her. I, I, there's a little bit of music I like, but I was kind of a musical neophyte in many ways. Uh, I didn't really know much of the music world. Couldn't play any music. Couldn't sing any music. I could play a radio, and that was the end of that. <laughs> but, you know, she loved music. She loves music. And as she started exposing me to different kinds of music, I went, oh, I think I love that too. And now suddenly I find, after these nearly four decades, something has radically changed in who I am because of her loves. And vice versa, and vice versa. So we know this happens. The people that we love, we end up, we end up incorporating what it is we love about them into who we are. Because we love, that's what we love. And that's how he transforms us. Is the more you get to understand the loving kindness of God, the more you start to fall in love with the things that make him want you to love him. It's very true of Jesus when he walked in his three-year ministry. People would see him do things, and they'd say, wow, 
I love that. I'm going to wake up tomorrow and see what he's going to do. And the day after that, and the day after that, and the day after that. I just can't get enough of this guy. And he's just different in so many ways. Not just the miracles, but do you know he actually loves tax collectors? Who can do that? You know he actually loves prostitutes? Who can do that? Do you know that he actually demonstrates his love for lepers by touching them? Who would do that? There's something about the lovingness of who God is that attracts us and we say, I want more of that. But then simultaneously, it condemns us because we're not like that. (sighs) But that's what he's fixing in relationship. Closer your relationship with God moves, the more you come to love who he is and the more he incorporates your love for those things in terms of who you are. And then it starts to come from the inside out and fruit appears and people say, where'd that come from? And you can say, from him. And that's the way it works. That's why he's left us here, to glorify him in that sense. Now we've been released from the law, no longer checklists, having died to that which held us captive. We were in prison to it. So that, this is interesting, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit. Now, if you're saying to yourself, I don't know what that means, Paul knows you don't know what that means because he hasn't hardly mentioned it at all in the entire book. But he's, He's presenting to us, a. Ah, this is like a brand new thought. Okay, so wait a second. So I don't have to live in a relationship to the law where I make a to-do list and check it off every morning, right? Right. Not because the law is bad, but that's not your relationship with the law anymore. You don't try and mimic the law by doing it. Something's radically changed in a relationship. But then now, now you're saying that I do a walk in a different way in the spirit. Well, what the heck does that mean? So I don't do a list but I do something else. He calls walking in the Spirit. Well, Paul's Paul's toying with us right here (laughs) because he hasn't told us what this is. In fact, if you go look in Romans up to this point about how many times he's mentioned the Spirit, well, I'll tell you that in a second. In the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. So that's the contrast. He's introducing to us that after Christ, after being justified with God, we now no longer walk under the law trying to satisfy what the law says. We now walk in relationship with him. We're not under the law. But we're in the spirit. So what, what, what? I need more hints than that. Well, next week we're going to have to find out about this. <laughs> it turns out that this word spirit in the Romans, this is, like a, this is like a huge what? If you look through all of Romans 1 through 7, this is what we're in. There's only three mentions. This is the third mention of the spirit at all in the entireness of Romans. But, but, turn the page into chapter 8, which is where we're going to finish this year. This is the third mention in seven chapters. Romans 8, there are 22 mentions of the Spirit. (laughs) So if his comment right here just made you think, wait, 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 I want to know what that thing with the Spirit is instead of making a list of the law every day. I got to do something else. What's that something else? Hold your horses. Chapter 8, 22 mentions of your relationship with the Spirit and how life now is different walking with the Spirit rather than walking under the law and trying to satisfy it. Radically different. So you're just going to have to hold your horses. Or if you just can't hold it long enough, go home tonight and read chapter 8. Because <laughs> he's as excited as we are. He just is teasing us right here, saying your relationship with the law has changed. We're not in the old way of the written code, but now, now, new way of the Spirit. And by the way, you've heard the terms Old Covenant and New Covenant? That's them right there. Old Covenant was all about trying to satisfy God's law by trying to just do the list. And it constantly condemned us. Constantly we fell short. The new covenant is doing it in the spirit. I still don't understand. That's okay. Wait till chapter 8. But you're going to have to wait a little bit longer because next week is not chapter 8. <laughs> we have a detour. <laughs> oh, you mean I got to wait? No, you can read chapter 8 tonight if you want. But here's the detour he's going to go to before we get to 8. And this is the real next week. The real next week he's going to talk about and answer this question. Is the law bad then? Which is a really, it's a, it's a pretty good observation. So if you're telling me that living the law in terms of making a list and checking it twice and doing it every day and feeling better about myself the more I do right, that's wrong, then the law must be wrong. No, the law is not wrong. The law is not wrong. But your relationship with the law is the issue. That's the whole issue. So he's going to take a detour before he, <laughs> he's tantalized us with this new life in the spirit. Whoa, tell me what that's all about! chill. You're going to have to chill till chapter 8. He'll tell us a lot. 
They'll tell us a lot about what that is. 22 times, spirit, 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 spirit. Something you can do other than make a list and check it twice and try and satisfy the law by mimicking it. Uh, no. So this is what we're going to do next week. Is the law essentially bad? And then the second thing he's going to ask himself, which we'll look at, is, so I still sin. What do I do with that? So he's going to talk about those two things. Start with, is the law bad? And then, and then I still sin. And then finally, he'll put us out of our misery and go to chapter 8 and say, okay, new life in the Spirit, let's talk about that instead of the old relationship to the law. Yes. And chapter 8 is all about this new covenant, this new arrangement, where, by the way, God gives us a preview in Jeremiah 31 and says, Psst, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour out my Spirit on those who follow me and... I'll write the law in their heart. Ah, something is radically shifting. Instead of living under the law by making a list, he's going to take the law and incorporate it into our passions. And that's what he's been doing. Those of us who've known, known Christ for a while, that's exactly what he does. He changes my passions and my relationship with him. I actually come to love the law and what it represents about the nature of who God is. And suddenly, oh my gosh, there's like, there's fruit popping out on me that I would never have had before Christ. Because before Christ, it wasn't about God. It was about me. And the fruit for me is boring, stupid, and selfish, and dead. It's dead. That's why when I see people who say, I'm going off to this New Age seminar, I'm going to go find myself. And I'm thinking, why would you want to do that? Because if you find yourself, all you've got is you. And don't you know enough about you to say that maybe that's not enough? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, one thing before I finish, though. I wanted to show you one parallel passage. This is, uh, <coughs> again, one of my top five verses in the entire New Testament. And Paul's going to say exactly what he said already in chapter 7 in a different way to the Corinthian church. So watch this. This is really cool. So here's our law guy again. He says, we have concluded this, that one has died for all, speaking of Christ, one has died for all, therefore all have died. You get that? Christ died, we're crucified with him, the old us dies. Okay? One has died for all, therefore all have died. Stay with him. And he died for all. Remember, saved from and saved to? He died for all that those who live, talking about us, might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. So it's a radical shift from living for ourselves, the hyphenated sins of self, self-interest, self-centeredness, self-loathing, <laughs> self-everything, to be removed from that and come out of relationship with ourselves to relationship with him. He died so that we might die with him, and he died for us so that we might now live for him who died for us. Ooh. It's, a really, it's a radical shift from being sprung out of prison to being brought into the unlikely relationship with God himself. And that's the new life. Again, old covenant, new covenant. The relationship with him. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. <sighs> this is where I get excited and I'm going to lose my voice, but I'm not going to. But this is, this is the picture you get all through the New Testament, and we're going to quit on this. This is the picture. It's not about just being saved from the wrath of God because we don't measure up to the law. It's actually being saved to life with Him, and in that intimate relationship, being transformed slowly to actually start to look more and more like him so that the things that we love about God is the things that our heart starts to love as well. Now there's a small amount of this nature of God that we love that I think is pre-programmed into all mankind. There is something about all mankind that when you look and hear a story, a, a fictional story about someone who against all odds and without any interest of self goes and gives their life for someone else who's in a terrible position, you know, and dies for them, and the person who's benefited goes, oh, it's wonderful. E.T. This creature from outside of our universe comes in and establishes a loving relationship with a little boy. 
And then the little boy and he are sick and the extraterrestrial dies for the little boy. Ooh, <laughs> this is great. And then, just as you think the relationship with the one who sacrificed out of love for the little boy, that relationship is gone because he dies, he comes back to life. <laughs> Yay! And then there's something tied between the two of them. And as he leaves again, his little glowing finger touches Elliot's heart and he says, I'm right here. My worst imitation right there. But there's something about that story and the nature of those kinds of stories. It's not unique. That kind of story is built into our DNA for us to say, that's an incredible love. And when I ever find a love like that, I want to be part of that. I love that love. And so in the story of the cross and this God who made us, who's outside of this place but is near to us, who wants us to come to a relationship, who wants us to understand what he's like and to be transformed in that nearness, he comes and demonstrates his love to us that even while we're yet sinning, Christ dies for us. And that love is so manifest throughout the timeline of history, it's just, you just can't deny it. And people who come to see that love and understand that love say, I want more of that love. Because there's something in me that says, this is where life is. This kind of love. Until maybe even you or I love that kind of love so much that we start loving people with that same kind of abandon. And now you're talking about a radically transformed fruit throughout all mankind. Radically transformed. Last week I, I, uh, I went online and I took a, took a tour of the Abbey Road recording studios in London. And uh, it meant a lot to me to go through this kind of soft tour of the Abbey Road studios because I used to live two blocks down the street from that when I was in high school. I lived in London, lived on Abbey Road. And uh, that's where the Beatles had recorded stuff. And that's where the Beatles... Uh, and they show you this in the walkthrough on the Abbey Road Studios. That's where the Beatles sat on four stools in there and did a live international broadcast of a song that they had written that they hoped would change the entire world. And they broadcast it live. All we need is love. That's what they sang. All we need is love. Now, nobody disagrees with that. I've yet to find anyone who disagrees with that notion. The problem is, is we don't do it because we're tragically bent on ourselves. But that kind of love they're talking about, the love, the sacrificial love for others that gives no thought or care of itself, that kind of love radically transforms us because God's pre-programmed our DNA to recognize it when he does it for us. All the world, what the world needs is love. Love, love, love. dun da da dun da da love, love. And it's true, and it's true. And that nearness to the loving God there's no way you can get out from it by not being changed. And then suddenly, what you love about him becomes what you love as well. And apples grow on your tree. Oh, such a radical change. So anyway, Paul has given you a foretaste of this life in the Spirit. If it's going to make you crazy to wait two weeks to hear about it, just read Romans 8. <laughs> You'll just be blown away. It's just incredible. What is the old life in my relationship to the law and making lists? How is that replaced by this new life in the Spirit? Oh, it's, it's like night and day. It's like night and day. And in that freedom, there is more law that comes out of your life than if you've made a list and tried to mimic it. Oh, and that's incredible. That's incredible. I think we need to quit. Do we quit here? Let's sing a song. I'm praying that we'll have the guys come back up and we'll sing a song for you.